pass us over. Renew in us, Lord, the knowledge of your dear son who lived, died, and rose forevermore, that he sits on the right hand of God the Father and he intercedes for us. When we pray to him, Lord, he hears and answers prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we come trusting today that nothing can separate us from your love. Heights, nor depths, nor powers, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. We come trusting today that the trials and tribulations of life testify to the truth that all things work together for good. We ask that you keep us in your mercy, Lord. Keep us in your care. Keep us in your love. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We greet you with the joy of the Lord. And again, we are grateful for this opportunity to study the word of God. Let us pray. Into your presence we come, thankful for spare life, for presence of mind, for desire to know more about you and to get closer to you. Now we pray, O oh God, that your presence would abide, that you alone would be glorified. In Jesus' name do we pray in that with thanksgiving. Amen. Well, we will look at uh, Mark chapter 11 uh, during this session. And uh, it begins with the triumphal entry in the gospel of Mark, as well as the others, synoptic gospels, Matthew and Luke. But the last week of Jesus' life is extremely significant, and it takes a disproportionate number of chapters in terms of the entire book. There are only 16 chapters in the uh, book of Mark, but um, the last week it begins with chapter 11. That's a, a, a little over a third of Mark's gospel is devoted to the last week, even though his the Lord's ministry was uh, about three years. And so we begin this very significant week in the, in the proclamation of who Jesus is with the triumphal entry. So some of you may ask, why, um, why so much emphasis on this last chapter? Remember the last chapter defines the ministry and the redemptive work, the sacrifice and the resurrection. And so everything that goes forward terms of teaching and miracles and um, um, preaching or life directing and they can be life changing but Jesus came not simply to be a teacher or miracle worker or preacher he came to be our savior and 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 so a third of the gospel is in Mark is devoted to his saving mission because without this last chapter, these last few chapters, last week, Jesus would have been like any other a great teacher or preacher or miracle worker in various faith traditions and in history. But this last third of the Gospels, 11 through 16, define and put in context and refine everything that Jesus said and did and told. If you will remember that um, as we have walked through the Gospel of Mark, there have been times when Jesus has said to those who, um, in, in whose 
whose life he worked miracles, do not tell. And he did this because he did not want um, people to misunderstand the, the, the purpose of his life. The, the, everything that he did is a demonstration of who he is as Savior and Lord. His teachings direct us about our daily living as we follow him. The miracles demonstrate who he is as Savior and Lord. The preaching inspire us to follow him as Savior and Lord. But from 11, chapters 11 to chapter 16, he fulfills his mission as Savior and Lord. And that is why this last week takes up a disproportionate number of chapters in the book of Mark because we follow the Lord as our Savior. And, 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 and it's important that we see him during this very significant period as he moves toward Calvary and beyond. <clears throat> so let's... Uh, Begin with uh, Mark chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 10. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a coat that has never been written. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a coat tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the coat? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the coat to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. <clears throat> Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. When he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Notice that Jesus is located in Bethany. Bethany, uh, Bethlehem, Bethpage, Emmaus were considered to be Sabbath day villages. The, 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 remember the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy six days, shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And that thou shalt not do any work, thou a man servant, thou maid servant, etc. <clears throat> so the issue came uh, about what is work. <clears throat> How far can you walk before your walking becomes is uh, uh, an act of labor? And so there were villages that were around Jerusalem that one could journey to on the Sabbath day without those journeys being looked upon as work. And those of you who are familiar with Jesus, good friends, close companions, 
Mary and Martha and Lazarus know that <clears throat> they lived in Bethany. And so Bethany was one of the places where he would <clears throat> lodge and rest and still be in line with the regulations regarding the Sabbath. And um, we see certain things about leadership. He thinks ahead so that he had already made arrangements for the Passover. He tells them where to go. And um, when his disciples or the delegation finds the coat tied, who had never been written according to his arrangements, you have to think ahead if you're going to be leaders. Uh, <clears throat> And, and they said, um, asked what they were doing. The response was, the Lord needs it. They did not say the Lord Jesus. They only said the Lord, indicating that the only, owner only had one Lord. How many Lords do we have whose opinions, whose decisions, whose <clears throat> affirmation we uh, listen to, the Lord, and where others can be persons of influence whom we respect and love, those of us who belong to Christ only have one Lord. And, and, and the donkey has never been written because our Lord gets our best and our first if he really is Lord, not the leftovers, but he gets our best and our first. And as you've heard me say, that's why we say uh, whenever we tie that the first dime out of every dollar goes to God because God gets the first. And, and, when, when he goes in, into town, the whole town is moved, but Jesus stays focused by the fact that after the parade was over, he goes into the temple, says that he was not carried away by temporary praise. And, 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 and real leadership, uh, <clears throat> while it, it is affirmed and heart is joy made joyful by praise and by compliment stays focused on his or her mission and um, and and so he stays focused and with intentionality surveys the temple before he cleanses it and and um, naturally the cleansing of the temple in the temple, there were five courts. There was the Gentile court where persons who were not Jewish could enter. And then next to that was the court of women. <clears throat> next to that was the court of men, only men. Next to that was the court of the priest. And um, court of the priest was where the priest entered to um, offer the sacrifice and then there was the Holy of Holies, where it was believed the presence of God dwelt. And it was so sacred that only once a year, the Day of Atonement, high priests would enter it and utter the name of God. And when he entered it to utter the name of God, a bell on a rope was tied to his ankles so that if he fell dead in the presence of God. He could be pulled out. They would hear the bell, and they could pull him out. The, the, the place where the, the sacrifices the, the, were, were, were sold, because you just couldn't bring any lamb. It had to be a lamb without blemish. And, 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 and the money changes because the, the money if it, if it had an, a graven image like a, uh, an emperor 
was not allowed to be uh, used in sacred giving. Um, <clears throat> that that, and so that took place in the court of Gentiles, and 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 the money changers were exploiting and gouging people for their um, for changing their regular coinage into sacred coinage and, and money. And it says that because uh, he with intentionality looks at what is going on, then when he cleanses the temple, naturally there are those who criticize. And um, when you are a leader, you have to be prepared for misunderstanding from many and for criticism of from others, particularly when their power is changed. Remember that it was the Sadducees who controlled the temple. And, and so uh, to, for him to act as Lord of the temple, to talk, to call his, the temple, my father's house was a challenge to their power. One of the things leaders must be prepared to face is uh, reaction, resentment, and anger when the power of people is challenged, often unintentionally. And that's why it's important that we maintain a prayer life because a prayer life not only keeps us focused, it also prepares us for the consequences of risky and controversial action. You can't be a leader if you're afraid of taking risk, and you can't be a, a leader if you are afraid of uh, doing things and saying things that not are wrong or rude, but create controversy because they may be new and radical to some people who are insistent on maintaining power in their small worlds. And a prayer life keeps you focused. <clears throat> That's why the Bible and the Gospels are, are so intentional about talking about Jesus' prayer life because for all of us, we, uh, we, we need that for courage and for focus. Some of us remember that old, old hymn, woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. You've heard me quote it before. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Verses 12 and 13. On the following day when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So, so that um, this, this teaching, this is what uh, is known as a teaching uh, um, um, parable. It was not the season for figs, but even though the time was not fully grown and mature for figs, ripe figs, there should have been some early ripe figs that occurred with the leaves before the main crop appeared. And the question is, does our faith and practice reflect the appearance of whom we claim to be or where we should be at this point in our life and faith journey as a believer? At a certain point, None of us has reached perfection. But we believe that God has a vision for our lives. 
that is greater than any vision we can have for ourselves, others can have for us. And so the question is, at this point, what are the early ripe figs that 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 let that are indication that that there is some depth, some power, and some true commitment behind our words. At a certain point, we shouldn't be uh, turned around by every strange wind on doctrine. By, at a certain point, we should uh, not be having our feelings hurt and quitting at the drop of a hat. At a certain point, there ought to be some depth of character that people can recognize that identify that we've been with Jesus. And so what, what are examples of religion that has leaves but no early right figs? I, I believe that failure to tithe and give generously is a religion that has leaves, but but no early figs. You 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 can't you cannot claim you love the Lord and not give. And what kind of love do we have that will not give God a dime out of a dollar? And what kind of love and 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 faith commitment do we have? that just stays there. I've had people say, I'll give a tithe, but no more. No, as God continues to bless, tithe is the foundation from which other generosity grows. Um, what an, another example of religion that only has leaves and no early right figs is a religion that has brought little, few souls into the kingdom or none into the kingdom. Many of us like to uh, uh, brag about our life and our tenure in the church, but in the course of time, how many souls have we really brought into the kingdom? What, how many people will on the judgment day stand and say, I am here? because of something that person said, something that person did, that their life inspired me. So, so that it is, if, if the, the purpose of Christian leadership is not just to be in charge, Christian leadership also ought to lead in winning souls. Leaves only religion has a fascination with our titles and our clout in the life of the church. If you want to get some people upset, don't call them by their title. We, we, we are in love with our titles. A fig, a religion that only has leaves. How vision or open are we to newness? Or is our desire to keep things as they are, even if times have changed. That, that's, re, re, faith grows. Faith is flexible. Um, there was a man who was blind and, and Jesus spat on in some clay, told him to go wash in a pool of Siloam. And, and then there was a man who was blind, and, and, and Jesus laid him off by himself, laid his hands and then laid him off by himself uh, until he saw correctly. Then there was blind Bartimaeus by the side of the road who were called out in a crowd, and Jesus healed them. Three blind people but he dealt with each one individually. He didn't say, 
well, this worked for the other one. This is all the work for now. I always speak to people I speak, and, uh, and, and the wind is hushed and the rain is still and storms stop. I speak, and the lepers are cleansed. I, I speak, and the dead are raised. There's power in my word. I've always used my word. No, there were instances in which he did something new and different. Circumstances of these persons were different. And whether we like to admit it or not, times have changed. And we have changed whether we realize it or not. And uh, uh, only... A religion with figs, with, with leaves, excuse me, is stuck in the past and wants it like it used to be. No, if every day is a new day that the Lord has given us, uh, people used to say, Lord, I thank you for this new day, one that we've never seen before one that we'll never see again. New day, then religion that has more than leaves is willing to try and adjust to the new. And as much as we enjoy worship and praise, there was a time when, when uh, choirs were not uh, looked upon with uh, with appreciation, and instruments uh, were, were looked upon with disdain. Uh, piano, organ, and then we went into the drums and uh, saxes and guitars because we recognize changing times. Where I'm coming to you now, represents a change of time. I'm, I'm broadcasting virtually. And even though we may one day have in-person Bible study, the virtual world is here to stay. And, and, and religion has to recognize that for the sake of the message, we can't do it like we've always done it before. Uh, so how visionary are we and open? And uh, does our fruit at this point re reflect our leafy appearance? Where is the fruit that goes along with our praise, our style of dressing, our titles and our tenure? Let's look at verses 20 through 25. In the morning, as they passed by, uh, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up, thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone so that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. We, we, we sometimes pray and uh, without believing. Um, let me um, point out a situation that occurred in the early church in Acts 12, verses 1 through 17. Um, Peter has been locked up. Here, here, 
Um, hear, hear the word of the Lord. About that time, King Herod laid violent hands upon some who belonged to the church. He had James, a brother of John, killed with the sword. After he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the festival of unleavened bread. When he had seized him, he put him in prison and handed him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, tending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. While Peter was kept in prison, the church prayed fervently to God for him. The very night before Herod was going to bring him out, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers, while guards in front of the door were keeping watch over the prison. Suddenly the angel of the Lord appeared and the light shone in the cell. He tapped Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly, and the chains fell off his wrist. The angel said to him, Fasten your belt, put on your sandals. He did so. Then he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Peter went out and followed him. He did not realize that what was, what was happening with the angel's help was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. After they had passed the first and the second guard, they came before the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went outside and walked along a lane when suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I am sure that the Lord had sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod from all that the Jewish people were expecting. As soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, the writer of our gospel, where many had gathered and were praying. When he knocked, where many had gathered and were praying, where many had gathered and were praying. Uh, when he knocked at the outer gate, a maid named Rhoda came to answer. On recognizing Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the gate, she ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she insisted that it was so. They said, it is his angels. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the gate, they saw him and were amazed. He motioned to them with his hand to be silent and described for them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he added, tell this to James and to the believers. Then he left and went to another place. The church was praying. It says, verse 5, while Peter was kept in prison, the church prayed fervently to God for him. When Rhoda tells them, that Peter was at the gate, uh, they said to her, you are out of your mind. But she insisted that it was so. They said, it is his angel. Now, they're praying, but not believing. Because when God answered their prayers, they didn't believe that it was Peter. You're praying for Peter to be delivered. He's delivered. And you're saying it's too good to be true. I don't believe it. This can't be happening. Well, we must pray believing. 
And when prayers are answered, why are we so surprised? Our, our response should be, God, I praise you. God, I'm humbled. God, I thank you. I'm not deserving. It's a miracle, not disbelief, that this is happening after we've been praying. No, we must pray believing in that, that our prayers will be answered. We must pray believing in the omnipotence of God. Since prayer is warfare, we must understand that all prayers are not answered instantly. And this is one of the great challenges because, you know, when we read the Bible, we see miracles happening right away, things happening right away, and and we seem to think that all of our prayers should answer, be answered. And if they're not answered right away, then it refutes the omnipotence of God. But prayer is warfare. And sometimes warfare is protracted struggle. And so if there is someone in your life whom the devil has claimed, uh, the devil's not going to walk away and give up on him because you say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. He's free. I declare his freedom. It won't happen when we have a weight and a sin that's so easily beset. But if we believe in the omnipotence, the almightiness of God, then we keep on praying, saying that God has more power. Someone has said uh, that the strongest demon in hell trembles when the weakest Christian prays because that weakest Christian is calling on the ultimate power. And so there will be times when, like Jacob, resting with the angel all night long, we just have to say, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me that the devil is a defeated foe. But because he's defeated does not mean he's given up. He will fight sometimes to see how earnest we are in terms of our willingness and our perseverance in opposing him. And, and so we... Uh, we pray uh, believing that even if they aren't answered, they will be in the fullness of times. And then sometimes we must pray through our own doubts so that we will have sufficient faith to believe. Because, you know, the devil, as you've heard me say, will assault you in your prayer closet and bring all kind of thoughts to your mind. And then sometimes we pray half believing. And sometimes we have to pray through our own doubts. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And, you know, we say if you trust and never doubt. Well, sometimes our doubts have not been overcome. But we still Pray through them. How do you overcome doubts? You pray through doubts. Um, and, and, and then sometimes we have to pray trusting the will of God. Um, because sometimes God does have a different will than we do. I've told you a story, this man who got sick and uh, he was the father of a preacher and this preacher called for all the saints uh, 
to join in prayer for her father's recovery. And her father died. And, and she and the other intercessors were saying, how could, how could he die the way we prayed? And at the funeral, the preacher preached from the subject, what does God want? Sometimes the will of God is different from our will. And then sometimes we have to pray uh, examining our own heart. Here, Psalm 139, uh, search me, O God, know my heart. Test me, know my mind. See if there is any wicked way in me and uh, lead me in the way everlasting. And then sometimes we just have to understand that all prayer depends upon God's mercy and not our merit. We say it every time we come to the communion table. Uh, we're not worthy so much as to gather the crumbs under thy table. But thou art the same Lord whose property is always to have mercy. Therefore, gracious Lord, grant us eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, drink his blood that our sinful souls and bodies may be made clean by his death, washed through his blood, that we may ever more dwell in him. He and us. Prayer depends on God's mercy, not our merit. And, and, and then... Let us um, um, conclude this. <laughs> Let us conclude these, this chapter with these last uh, few verses. Again, they came to Jerusalem as he was walking in the temple. The chief priests, the scribes, the elders came to him and said, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me. Now I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? Answer me. They argue with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But shall we say of human origin? They were afraid of the crowd for all regarded John as truly a prophet. So they answered, we do not know. Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. When we pray, the Lord sees, let me put it this way, Jesus saw their intent. The Lord sees our intent and motive. When we pray, are we praying to God to be heard or seen? are complimented by people. Some of us pray great prayers that, that sound good, but do they reach heaven? When we give, what is our intent? The Lord sees and understands the motive behind our giving. When we serve, what is our intent? Remember the Lord. So Jesus refused to play their questions, play their silly games, because he saw that their intent was not sincere. When we speak or raise questions or issues, the Lord knows the intent. The Lord is too wise to fall into our self serving and political games. We must also pray for discernment regarding others. And so I think that there is a prayer that um, all of us should pray. It's, it's that famous prayer uh, that was offered by David. And, and I want to pray it again because I think it's, the kind of prayer that we all should pray if we're going to be honest to God. Have mercy on me, Psalm 51, verses 1 through 
17. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence, blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be cleaner than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Stain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach trans transgressors your ways. Sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips. My mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in in sacrifice, if I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken heart, a broken, contrite heart, O oh God. You will not despise the God who knows our intent and motives will hear and answer that prayer. And so... That same God is prepared to hear your cry if you ask for salvation. And so before we end, we offer you the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your own Savior and Lord. If you've not really said to him, Lord, I want you in my life, sincerely and open and honestly and truly, then email us at info at stphilip.org. Someone is waiting. Be happy to pray the prayer of salvation. And if you are saved, if you have a church home, but you're not growing, or the Lord is leading you to become a member of St. Philip Church family and community of faith. I'd love to be your pastor. We would love to be your church family. Just email us now at info at stphilip.org. And because we serve a giving and forgiving God, and because our Savior gave his life that we might be redeemed, become a new creature. And because he lives now, give to us victory over all assault and attacks of the enemy upon us, upon we love. Then it is appropriate that we pause and give. And so right now, uh, you may give an offering of thanksgiving and worship and praise to Almighty God. You may drop it by the church, mail it to the church, 
use one of our electronic means, cash app, uh, text to give, kiosks, uh, uh, givelify, online giving. However the Lord leads you, just give because he alone is worthy of our first and our best. Well, we look forward to being with you, and our prayer is that the favor of God will continue to rest upon you. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for this time. We pray for fresh fire in our heart, new understanding in our minds, new courage in our spirit and new vision in our thinking for all you have done, for all you're doing right now, for all you're about to do. Thank you. Increase our faith that we might receive that for which we've prayed and that for which we believe you desire to give us. Victory in all things. Jesus' name do we pray. Amen. Amen.